Thank you, Aaron. I have uh, given this presentation uh, so many times, and in this presentation, I've always said, you could take this and uh, change it a little bit for any other religion or, or cult, uh, but I, I probably never have done it, actually. And then today, I thought, well, not today, but three days ago, I thought, well, maybe I need to put that to practice. So I'm going to do two things today. I'm going to run through it as if I was giving this uh, evangelism tool to uh, an LDS person on a meet on the street, uh, a stranger, and then we're going to flip that and I'm going to pretend like I'm giving it to uh, a Hindu or a Krishna follower uh, uh, and see how it works. But the, the caveat is I have never used this on the street with a Krishna person, so it may actually fail once I put it out there. <laughs> but so just to let you know, like, man, I'm doing what this guy said and this is not going anywhere. So, <laughs> but I did run it through uh, Ed's um, and, and make sure that the terminology would kind of work, the concepts perhaps could work. I don't know. We're just going to play around with that. So that's why I gave you this piece of paper is, um, again, I took um, a document that Ed gave me, all the important verses in the Gita. And so I'm, I'm one of these guys quite lazy. I probably not going to read all 18 chapters of this. So I love it when guys, um, somebody, read this thing and said, well, here's some good verses, and then I look at these, and then so probably what I will do, instead of reading all 18 chapters, I will go back and, and read in context and make sure this is what it says, it's, it, this is what it means, uh, and make sure. Also, a tool that I learned early on in um, Mormonism is to put little tabs um, in, the, in the book, and so, if you see my uh, Book of Mormon, you'll see these tabs all in this, you know, and, and they're green, and they're orange and yellow and blue, and they all stand for something different. Uh, that's probably the way I will, I just got this Gita, so I'll probably do the same thing with the Gita. Uh, I'll put my tabs and, and color code it, and then I'll be able to flip, and then, so the more I use the Gita, the more I use the tool, it'll come more natural, and I'll probably end up memorizing some of these things, but, that's, that's what you do when you, you reach out to the same people group. You end up memorizing um, their documents and their stuff. And that gets stuck in your head. Um, also, what we're going to use it for, is, I forgot to bring scratch paper. So this is a very practical uh, presentation. And I want you to pull out a piece of paper, pencil, and get ready. Because this is literally what I do out on the streets. I like to make up my own track. So I had a hard time finding any tracks that talk about the imputation of Christ's righteousness anyway. There's just, there's just not any out there. Uh, they all talk about expiation. They always talk about taking away sin. So Christ died on the cross to take away your sin debt. They never talk about, and he also lived a perfect life on your behalf to give you all of his works. And so imputation is often left out of tracks. Well, you can pay a bunch of money to print your own, or you can just manufacture your own as you go. So all you need is a steno pad and a piece of paper and you're ready to go. Also, I find that uh, it helps to draw their attention. And so, you know, I'm here with, with you and uh, we're drawing it out and we're all talking and um, uh, it, it helps me uh, stay on task. It helps them and then we're just kind of drawing it out and they're giving me answers and we're filling it in and, and they don't feel like this is taking forever. I wish I had never said yes to this guy. So, and then when you're done, you're just like, and here you go. It, you know, um, you can even put your contact information on it, and there you go. So that's the what I'm going to do. So if you'd like to, I would love it if you pull this out and just use this piece uh, right here. We're going to go through it. I'll use the uh, whiteboard here my low-tech approach. So imputation is giving you something. Um, so giving you his righteousness. Uh, sometimes it's called the w, double imputation approach that we're giving him uh, our sin debt and he's giving us his righteousness. So this is basically your doctrine of justification by faith alone. How are you made right with God. I draw it out, so we're going to use a little mathematic. Uh, 
I'm left brain because I'm not right. Draw out some parameters. I always ask, who do you think is infinitely righteous? Anybody? Christ. They always say it. So start off with some easy questions. Everybody can get right, building up their confidence, right? Infinite sin. And I asked the LDS person, remember, we're going to do LDS first, and then we're going to play around with it uh, as if we were meeting somebody from Krishna conscious. What are some things you're still doing wrong? What are some uh, commandments you're still breaking? What would they be? Somebody just shout it out. What, what are some commandments you guys aren't, aren't uh, obeying all perfectly? Love your neighbor as yourself. Go ahead. Self-control. And? So the reason I do that is to get them some buy-in. Of course, if they're like, mm, I'm just not ready to be vulnerable and open, you can kind of tell that on their face. Throw some lying, cheating, and stealing on there and just kind of move on. But if you can get some buy-in, perhaps the Holy Spirit is really working on them and the fact they've been stealing some time from their employer or they've been lusting after another woman or something like that. You'd be surprised that people are like, ooh, I'm still doing this. And I, I think that sets you up for, for some, a, a good conversation. Again, if it doesn't come, just throw something down. Uh, and then some positives. This one always just comes flowing right out. So negatives, not so much. Positives, oh, I got plenty of those. Stop them at three. You need some space. So what are some great things you've been doing? Coming to evangelism conferences. Oh, coming to conferences. Okay, so we're, let's... let's Pretend like we're, we're LDS. Put down, oh, I've done my mission work, right? Tithing. Temple, tithing. Scripture study. And then, see what I'll tell you, but they will just flow out. So, <laughs> great, great Mormon this, Aaron is. Um, so, but stop them and make sure you have this one at the top, okay? Because we're going to use this one. And they usually say baptism anyway. Yeah, make sure that one's on there because we're going to use that specifically. Leave some room because you're going to need room for grace, right? No one thinks they're going to be um, perfect in this lifetime. They've already said Christ is the only perfect one. So they are not going to make it to the infinite righteousness. They're going to do their part and then uh, Jesus is going to give them the rest of the grace to bring them to the full part. So it's a cooperation. I get this idea from their scripture. Um, maybe I'll use some contrast. And so I want it to be simple. I want it to be quick. I don't want to talk about a ton of verses. Just one. And this one is, we know we are saved by grace after all we can do. I uh, right, already messed up. After. So it's a temporal word. We understand after. <coughs> and uh, this, is, this is basically what we have on the diagram, doesn't it? And I always, I'm giving them a lot. I'm giving them a lot. And don't go on rabbit trails because you, you have to get through the whole conversation. And so I understand there's a, there could be a lot of talk about this. You know, where did the atonement happen? In the garden? On the cross. I just give it to him on the cross, and this is the reason why. I want to throw something in there that we could come together um, and still be uh, on the same page and going somewhere. And so I say, well, and the, an LDS person will always say this too. They say, well, are, are you trusting that Christ uh, died on the cross to take away your sin debt? And they say, yes. And so we're going to put this down there. Okay. And we're still agreeing. I agree about that too. My, my debt of sin is taken away by the, the cross and his uh, atonement for me. And I said, this is, this is where we can all agree. And then we're, but I want to show you something that's different. 
this is where it's different. Is you're trusting that Christ died on the cross to take away your sin, that the fact that you did not obey commandments. But I and I am trusting in that too. But I'm also trusting in his life. He did all he did a mission. Uh, he did a t temple work and, and gave his tithing and uh, he he was baptized. He did all of this work perfectly to give it to me. So as it, it's as if uh, it was uh, my uh, mission. It was if uh, it was his temple work or his money. It was as if uh, his baptism counted for my baptism. And so he gives that to me. This is uh, all of it on a positive, isn't it? And this is, uh, this is a negative. He takes away all the negative things about me and gives me all the positive things about himself. And that's not my idea, but it's in Scripture. It's in 2 Corinthians 5.21. And I write that one out here. You can pull that up in your Bible right now. I'll wait for you. And I make sure that they understand it's, it's the Word of God that is speaking about my idea. And so that's why I want to bring out the Bible. Two, I want to make sure they understand we're the people of the book. If it says it in here, then we're really passionate about it and we speak as if this is true. Uh, it's not going to be our ideas. It's not the latest guru. It's not the latest uh, guy. You know, the John uh, Pipers are going to come and go. That's fine. Uh, somebody else is going to step in their place and it's going to be, he's going to hand, he's going to be handling this uh, rightly. He's going to be rightly dividing the, the word of God. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Why? What for? What purpose? So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So notice that this spoke of this plan. This verse speaks of this plan. We have written both plans on the board. But notice we went from all the way down here all the way up to there to the righteousness of God. He takes away the sin and he gives me all of his righteousness and that came from 2 Corinthians 5.21. I hope that was only about five or so minutes, a couple of minutes. Uh, Aaron gave some really Good words of wisdom. Don't keep them too long. Uh, they may have place to go. They might be utterly not interested in what you have to say. So why spend a whole hour with somebody that has no interest in you and would just like to leave? So I'm looking for body language at this point. This is, this is how much I'm trusting in Jesus. How, how much are you trusting in Jesus? What's their response? Is the body language, yeah, really neat, nice, I'm ready to go. Are they already turning? Are they pensive and you're like, hmm, let's say this again. Give them some time. It's not really any rush, is it? If the Holy Spirit is working on them, give them some time. Ask them if they have any questions. Uh, does this make sense? Do you believe this? Sometimes they say, oh, yeah, yeah, I believe that. And I don't know if they're being honest, they truly believe it, or that's just a tactic to, mm -hmm. you know, just diffuse everything. So that's why I want to go in for some clarity mm -hmm. with the Philippians 3. That's why I brought out baptism, right? So if you believe this and you rightly understand it, then let me, let's put it to the test so to speak, to make sure. Also, you know, we're supposed to ask if somebody believes on the Lord Jesus 
and they repent. To me, that means they need to turn from the position that they are in to the position that I am giving them. If you don't give them a place to go, how can they repent? They have nowhere to turn to. I'm giving them a place to repent, right? This is where I'm going to lay down. I've got to give them a place to turn to if I'm going to ask them to repent. I do want them to trust in Jesus' life as well as his death. That's already been clear but where is the repentance? We'll find it in three. You can start at verse one and verse two and talk about the dogs and the circumcision. You can drop in to just verse five where it talks about Paul's works. So you can set it up or you can just read it. But Paul's gonna be talking about what he has done in the flesh. I like his, his language. If anyone, this is verse four. I'll wait, is everybody there? I'll wait till you're, you're <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far, I far more. So he's going to tell you his little list, right? It's nice that I've already drawn this out because I can point to it. So I'm pointing, literally pointing to the list. I'd be pointing to my piece of paper. Look at his list. Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. And then he contrasts all of that with the word but, in verse 7. Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. So he's contrasting all of his little works, and he's considering them loss. He's considering as if he never did those. When, when he was circumcised, it didn't help him at all. When he memorized all the law and then went out and did all the law, it doesn't help him at all. He's willing to give all of that time, uh, uh, throw it away, consider it rubbish. Uh, the Greek word there is uh, poop. Um, so he's considering all of the good works just poop. It's, it's terrible. Just throw it away. Uh, why? Why? because he wants to be found in him, verse 9, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, the things that I did to accumulate positive righteousness for myself, uh, derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. So he's saying, I'm going to trust his righteousness, trust, faith. I'm going to trust his righteousness and then I get it. So if you're saying I, I believe that already and, and that's me, then I have to ask you a, a question about your baptism. Do you consider your baptism a waste of time? Do you consider your baptism didn't come with any authority? It, it, I was just getting wet that day. If you're wanting to throw away your LDS baptism because you know that Jesus was baptized on your behalf, then you're trusting in His baptism, not your baptism. I'm not saying you don't need to be baptized. That's a totally different question, but I'm trying to press in the point. Are you going to trust in your works, your righteousness accumulated from the law, or do you consider that rubbish? Do you consider that dumb, gross, Throw it away. Burn it up. See how I'm giving them a place to repent too. They need to change their opinion about their works and change their opinion about Christ's works. As in, can he give me all of his good works? Could I have his perfect prayer record given to me as if I woke up 3 o'clock in the morning, hiked a mountain, prayed for exactly 
what I was supposed to pray for, is exactly how long I was supposed to pray for, and stopped praying when I was supposed to pray. I didn't pray for any selfish things for myself. I prayed for uh, you know, other people. Everything that God's will was prayed for perfectly. Have I ever even done that once? And Jesus did it every single day of his life for 33 years on behalf of his people so that he could give this righteous standard, this I have kept the Mosaic law for you on your behalf because I know you can't do it. But we're, we're requiring of you perfection. And so he gives us his perfect record so that we can stand before God, considered, counted as perfect. I haven't had one single LDS person say they're ready to throw away their baptism, unfortunately. Uh, so they uh, said they believed it all when we clarified it and pressed in, uh, they, they just walked it back. And that's pretty sad to me, but I did give them the piece of paper and off they went and God can do whatever he wants to do with that. So, so like I said, uh, well, does anybody have any questions on that? Was that clear enough that I? Then the challenge is, well, how would you, how would you put this in terms for uh, somebody that follows Krishna consciousness? So, like I said, Ed really helped me out with this. This is only 18 chapters, by the way. That's a lot for 18 chapters. Oh, I, I thought, well, <laughs> the last quote's only 18 chapters, so I'm thinking, oh, this must be 64. Ed, Ed gave me only a part of the book, and then I'm like, oh, no, there's 18 chapters here. These are big chapters, my friend. So a lot of stuff here, but again, got this cheat sheet. Let's move into what would I do if I ran across um, I could still use some of this. They're going to have different works, aren't they? They might even, exactly, there you go, Aaron. So they're going to have uh, different n negatives. Well, you know what? They might have the same negatives, but I'm purposely going to use the negatives that are written in the Gita. Hmm. You could probably keep most of this because our answer is still the imputation of Christ. It's just a different law for them. Right? And so they don't have a two-year missionary journey. They don't have 10% of their tithing. They don't have a water baptism kind of thing. They don't have that kind of stuff. And so you put that aside because this is a different people group. You need to speak their language and try to um, figure out how would you make this connection with them. So we're kicking around this idea. It may actually fail. Uh, that's okay. Christ has already done a perfect job anyway on our behalf, so you're free to fail. It is really okay, <laughs> right? That's the application of the imputation of righteousness. So go ahead and grab the paper here for the important Gita verses. I organize this uh, systematically, so what does it say about God? God is everywhere. He's the creator of all things. Of course, what, they're, what do you mean by is Krishna? So Krishna is everywhere. Krishna is the creator of all. Krishna is the Lord of all. Krishna causes all things. Is this sounding familiar? Uh, Krishna is coming back. So these are, these are things we would say about our God. Very similar. You can read over those. Um, what we'd say about man, mm, there, there comes a big difference there. Um, eternal soul. Go ahead and look at this, though. This is for this chart and for the purpose of a class. We could put in here the, uh, the positive things first, since I listed the do, do these things. Uh, notice here, so this is Gita chapter 3, verse 9. Work done as a sacrifice for Vishnu has to be performed. Otherwise, work causes bondage in this material world. Therefore, perform, perform your prescribed duties for his satisfaction. 
And in that way, you will always remain free from bondage. So do they have work to do for Krishna's satisfaction? They need to work so that, that it's approved to Krishna. So we could kind of put that down here if we wanted. Work done for Vishnu. That's actually what their document says. Um, look down here. Uh, we got the second one. 815. After attaining me, the great souls who are yogis. Is that Ed? Is that how you would say it? Yogis? I take it those are who perform yoga. It's a yogis. Yeah, these, so who are uh, yogis in devotion never return to this world because they have attained the highest perfection. In other words, do your yoga. A lot of yoga. How much yoga? Maybe daily yoga. I don't know. Perhaps a good question to ask them. How much time do you spend yoga? Just do it once. If you have to do it again, you weren't successful. Maybe you need that one perfect yoga. What, are you wasting your time? You have to do it over and over again. Uh, thirdly, uh, 914 says, always chanting my glories, endeavoring with great determination, bowing down before me. These great souls perpetually worship me with devotion. Mm -hmm. I mean, perpetually, good time. Temporal word. I always pick up on those temporal oh, words. Yeah. You just got to keep doing that? Sounds like our... Uh, you go to the bathroom break to get bathroom breaks? Uh, the Kiever's question, how often? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, we're asked to pray continuously, aren't we? You know, we're told to pray continuously. Uh, perpetually worship me in, in devotion. Could you do a little bit more? We've often used kind of those questions. Could you done a little bit more yoga? Could you do a little bit more chanting? Do you feel like you've done enough? But those are some positive, some positive karma things, right? You'd expect good things to happen to you if you've done enough of these things. So you get what you pay for, you get what you put in. So you do enough of yoga in the mornings, you do enough of chanting, and then you go off in, in your work and you just expect, I'm getting, I'm getting sales after sales after sales. And whatever I, I do towards, uh, in, in service to Vishnu, I should be getting paid back. Do you experience this? Kind of a, could be a question. Uh, the, the Gita does have some things, you, some, some law, some things that you're not supposed to do. And it gives you three right off the bat. I'm probably going to just use 1621 and I'll just use the three right there. You know, less anger and greed. 1621 says, these are three gates leading to this hell. Oh, there are three gates leading to this hell. Lust, anger, greed. Every sane man should give these up, for they lead to the degradation of the soul. So I would probably just, well, it sounds like you shouldn't be doing these three things. This is, would be your negative karma. Uh, kind of one thing that comes around, goes around. If you're doing the, if you're greed, greedy in your business dealing, somebody else is going to be greedy towards you. Perhaps it'll show up the next time you try to buy uh, tires for your car. Who knows where it's going to come from. Um, so is this your life experience? How do you think about it? This is where... I don't know, maybe this would communicate, maybe not, of, uh, well, I expect my negative karma and the consequences from my negative karma to be taken away because Christ has died on the cross for me. Is that going to communicate? I'm not sure. Um, I wonder if this is a good bridge. Uh, talk, talking about the justice of God more to fear in the justice of God than the karma of Vishnu. Um, the justice of God is actually more harsh than karma, but the grace of God is more rich than karma. There's, there's no grace in karma. It's just all 
Mm. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you can clearly see this is a works-based yeah. religion. You're going to get what you get out of it. You need to cooperate with this positive karma. Never doing anything negative karma. Always doing something positive karma and more positive karma. And staying in a position of positive karma. Um, does this wear you out? Are you tired for this? I don't know. What are your feelings about it? Share with me. I don't really know what this experience is like. So, and you can figure out where to go from there. But the, uh, since this is off a uh, positive righteousness and it comes from you, that's why I think you can use imputation of righteousness as an answer. Mm -hmm. Because our righteousness never comes from us. We're not cooperating with God, bringing you know, our good works. Again, you may be tempted to say, well, we don't have any good works anyway, and throw out Isaiah. Well, you're right, but remember, in order to do this method, you got to give them a little bit. So you got to just assume they're, they're right, their works are okay and not filthy rags. <laughs> uh, you're reducing their argument to, to absurdity, uh, and in order to do that in a logical sense, you got to kind of give, give them a little bit. You can always go back. You can always go back and talk about the free will of man. Can't actually produce any good works. You could always go there. But I understand you'd have to say, well, do you really get any positive karma? We know it doesn't exist. But in this method, you'd have to pretend that it does exist. And what do you expect from it? So, uh, this, yeah, I didn't, I didn't put on here. I, yeah, sorry. Uh, you'd need to, uh, probably if I was going to do it, to, to make sure that you're quoting the Gita just like we did, read through the Gita, you know. I, I also uh, think that when you read through, uh, or you know Book of Mormon verses and you've memorized them, it does gain some credibility with your audience. If you represent uh, LDS properly or if you represent uh, karma, consciousness, uh, you will gain some respect from your audience. They're like, oh, well, you actually have taken some time to get to know what I believe. And you're not misrepresenting me and you're not creating some straw man or, or anything. Uh, so I think that's valuable there as well. Take a little bit of time, get to know your audience, who the people are that you're going to. Memorize a few things. It is, it is work. Uh, or tab up your book a little bit. Get familiar with it and then start you to, uh, using it, and it'll be easier. The more you use the tool, the easier it'll be. Okay, yes, sir. At the Color Festival, how common is it for you to interact with someone who actually holds this worldview? What's the makeup? What's the demographic of the average attendee? It, it changes every year. So I think like the last, I don't know, Timothy, have we been going out to that thing for 15 years or something? Wow. When, we first, when I first moved here, did we say, hey, let's go out there? Mm -hmm. And it was, 100% white people, and they're all college kids. So it was the three major, major colleges were out there. That's what I remember, Timothy. Uh, and then as the years go on, I don't know if immigration has changed, what has changed. Uh, there's more Indian, Pakistani, um, Sri Lanka. You know, that area is just uh, predominantly Hindu. Uh, I see more and more as the years go on people. Uh, coming and and I really don't have anything else but the gospel to talk to them. It's, it's just the first year that that Ed brought the the fact that well you could study their works and talk about their their work with them and so I've never actually approached any anybody else with uh, I have questions about the Gita. Do you have some time? I'd be interested to see if that would yeah. would well, kind of work. So Saturday, yeah, though, right, okay. wow. and maybe maybe ten percent other atheists, including the, the Hindus. Mm. Yeah, they do have a caste system here. It's still, I was really surprised to find that they do have a caste system here. I was uh, out there once. I I can't remember whose birthday it is. So this particular color festival, this is this is Krishna's day. I know it's a Krishna temple, but they like to celebrate the other gods on occasion. Throw them a bone. Uh, make the birthday cake. I don't know, uh, but it's a birthday of somebody. So I'm out there, and it's a birthday of somebody, and and I'm passing out gospel tracts. I don't even. I'm probably passing out my imputation track, and I apparently gave one to the princess. 
she was decked out, but I don't know. She just she's just another person that needs a gospel track to me. But she went by, thanked me, everything. She was decked out. Ooh, did I get in trouble? So they figure out she's over there reading my gospel track, wow. and um, <laughs> I could not believe that man of such low. Uh, stature would even approach the the high princess, you know. So I did get in trouble uh, with it. So they've they've got similar things going on. You you just don't even know. Uh, but uh, I just approach people as I see them, and uh, they're just another person made in the image of God to me. So you run into some fun things out there. Get out there and explore uh, and share the gospel. You just run into some very interesting. Things. They were very upset that I had given a gospel tract to the princess. You go Sunday? So they, Sorry. I go on Saturday. I'd rather be with the people yeah. uh, on Sunday, but um, I'm not taking that from a strict Sabbatarian system. You're, you're free to go both days, especially if you came all this way to witness to Hindu people, then, then get out there yeah. and uh, save your local church day for when you get back home, maybe. I, so I... I've gone out on Sundays. I noticed the crowd was lower. I went after church, but I didn't really go for witnessing. I just went with a trash bag because I noticed we were, um, that particular year, we were putting out gospel cards on people's cars and people were just tossing them. And I thought, this is not a good witness for the Christian community that we're just creating waste. You know, I mean, technically, I didn't throw it down on the ground. Somebody else did, but, you know, do you really want to press that? Yeah. They're going to see it as, oh, this Christian literature is everywhere, and I wish the Christians would stay away. So I went to pick up trash, but I noticed on Sunday there's hardly anybody there. Mm -hmm. Why? Because 90% are LDS. Where are they? They're at their own ward meetings, and so I'm not even sure who goes on a Sunday. But I, I, if you guys go... I'd be happy to know who'd you run into. Was it the same crowd, or did everybody punch their ticket on the event on Sunday or Saturday, and they didn't even go on Sunday? Yeah, also, so. know, break down your experiences. We can debrief <coughs> on that. If you get a question you can't answer, you get a question you don't know what it means. We can <coughs> can run it up the flagpole and get uh, more feet, and then you build a repertoire so you get an idea of. Uh, so the next year, next year when we do this, that we have a backdrop, we can be more specific about age groups, what groups uh, you're talking to, um, the, uh, the, the gurus, the, the, uh, the, the monks, or you're talking to people who are LDS and they're just coming down there. Take a catalog of what questions they're asking and what kind of pushback you get. That's good too. I really enjoy the debrief time. So if you're leading a team on a missionary trip and they have or haven't done a lot of stuff, so it's, it's good to do a debrief. Uh, in the evenings or in the morning the next time, you know, what kind of conversations did you come across? Uh, how did you answer these things? And then as a leader of the team, you could say, well, a better answer might have been this, or I'm sorry, this happened to you, or whatever. You can kind of uh, gauge your team um, in, in what they're coming up with, learning experience and how to navigate certain things. So it's also nice to debrief. So if you're if it's your first time doing evangelism, you're like, I don't know if I did it right or wrong. This is what happened. Mm -hmm. It's it's good to uh, encourage uh, brothers and sisters um, in their responses and what happened, and um, yeah. just debrief. So good point. Yep. Well, that's all I have. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. I hope this is. Uh, helpful in getting conversations uh, going so that you can uh, share the gospel with people.